the Work Institute for Austrian and Central European Studies here at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to a question and answer session with our esteemed guest from Poland, Dr. Eva Wilietzek. She is a assistant professor at the University of Silesia, and we will, I will talk a little bit more about her and introduce her a bit more in a moment. Before I do that, though, I would like to tell all of you that Ava's presentation was already posted, and you should have seen this already, right? You, the idea is that you watched it, you got her insights, you saw the art that she's going to discuss, or that she did discuss, and today is a discussion of her presentation. It's not any new material that's going to be presented, so in case that wasn't clear. Uh, we would like you to participate as best you can through the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. If you look at the screen here, you'll see a Q&A function, and you can participate and write your questions, and then I'm going to be the moderator um, for this part of it. I have a few questions of my own. Uh, a few people have been uh, sending me questions to ask Ava because she wa they weren't able to attend uh, the discussion this morning. But I really hope that the rest of you will chime in and uh, this will be a free form, free flowing uh, discussion of issues relating to Silesian identity uh, in the contemporary world in particular. Uh, this presentation today is in some ways instead of or yeah, as part of a visiting professor program that exists between the University of Alberta and the University of Silesia. For now about five years, every year we've had one professor from Silesia come to, come to Edmonton to uh, give presentations and participate in life here in Edmonton. And conversely, we've always had, we've had one professor from the University of Alberta go to Katowice or Sosnovia, it's one of the campuses uh, in of the University of Silesia. And because of the COVID virus this year, unfortunately, the University of Alberta representative wasn't able to go last spring to Poland. And Eva, who was chosen as the University of Silesia representative, wasn't able to come here to Edmonton. So as a temporary and only temporary replacement for this program, we ask her to give this presentation and then we could have this discussion, partly to introduce her to you, uh, to the people at the University of Alberta and elsewhere, uh, so that now when she comes, when we finally do have uh, the opportunity to meet her in person and for her to come, uh, you'll know her already, you'll know some of her interests, uh, maybe they'll be able to, you'll be able to build on some of the connections that we established in this presentation or this, this event this morning. What else do I want to say about the Silesian exchange? Well, I would say in general that the uh, University of Alberta and the University of Silesia have been connected for many years, mostly because of the um, activities of the head of our Polish studies program, Dr. Václav Osadny. Uh, Professor Osadny, of course, is not able to be with us this morning because he's teaching. He has actually pedagogical responsibilities uh, at, the, at this moment. But he, had, he was an instructor once at the University of Silesia back in the day, and he's maintained connections and sent Polish language and literature students from the University of Alberta to the uh, Polish Language Institute, which is held every summer in, at the University of Silesia. So we've had University of Alberta students going to Silesia to one of the campuses, I think the, the campus up in the hills, if I'm not mistaken, um, not the one down in Katowice, uh, for, for, for a long time. And building on that relationship, Five years ago, we signed a formal agreement between the University of Alberta and the University of Silesia, which set up this exchange program, uh, which we have also now expanded. We had some Erasmus Plus exchanges. I know Ava is the Erasmus Plus coordinator in her institute. Maybe we can build on that relationship too in the future. Um, I gave a public lecture at uh, Katowice last spring. Uh, in the Institute of History. So there have been additional connections and we hope this is just one more step in building closer ties uh, between the University of Silesia and the University of Alberta. So all of that being said, maybe the other thing I, I should mention in background before we get into the Q&A uh, is that uh, this presentation today is part of a collaborative project undertaken by all all of the Austrian and Central European centers in North America. 
there are actually four of these centers. We have the University of Alberta's Worth Institute, which I represent uh, here, but we also have colleagues uh, and institutes at three universities south of the border uh, in the United States. Uh, there's one at the University of uh, Minneapolis, uh, Twin Cities. There's one at the University of New Orleans, and there's one at the University of California's Berkeley campus. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the colleagues at those three institutes for this collaboration. And probably in the course of today's uh, presentation, we'll send you information or post information about um, the last of the four talks which we jointly organized. We had one already by the Minnesota Institute, uh, one already by the Berkeley Institute, uh, and uh, in next week, there'll be the fourth in this series, uh, which is going to be sponsored by the University of New Orleans uh, Institute. Maybe I'll mention a little bit more about that uh, in the future. Okay, so one final housekeeping point to make before we get into the discussion too, and that is that if you look at the, again, there's two different opportunities to participate in the discussion. The primary one I'd like to ask you to use is the Q&A function at the bottom, but there's also the chat function. Right, and I see already that the Austrian Joint Centers events has been posted to the chat function. So if you'd like to know more about these events that I just mentioned and the other Austrian centers supported by the Austrian Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research, that would be the link uh, to go to. Okay, so now let's talk, let me talk, not more for no more than 20 or 30 minutes about our esteemed guests here who, uh, <laughs> going to be, uh, who was so kind to give us uh, her presentation yesterday that we posted. Um, she'll be talking today about Silesian identity, or will be talking today, will be discussing today her ideas about Silesian identity. And this makes sense, uh, I think, from Ava's perspective for some, because she is a Silesian from birth and from education. From what I understand, reading through her um, materials, her CV and resume, she uh, has a BA and MA in English literature from the University of Silesia. And in 2018, she finished her doctoral studies at the University of Silesia in literary studies with a dissertation called Tropes of Tauermachen, Representations of Bullfighting in Selected Works of Anglophone Literature in the 20th and 21st Centuries. Uh, this work, I think, was published then in 2019. Uh, she has vault, uh, various interests. She's worked also um, in the world, world of translation studies, which may be of interest to people here at the University of Alberta with our uh, field of translation studies. The English and film, uh, the uh, Modern Languages and Cultural Studies Department has a translation studies certificate program and sponsors every year a workshop that we work with them on, on translation studies, the St. Jerome's Day workshop. So when I read that your most recent publication is a book chapter titled Loss of Translational Innocence uh, in the collection Infidelity, in Fidelity in Translation, I thought, aha, there are people here at the <laughs> Alberta who might like to work with you or talk with you about your ideas of infidelity and translational incident, uh, innocence. Uh, uh, Eva has studied in Spain. She's been a guest lecturer at the University of Eastern Finland. And um, I, we're again happy to be able to have this opportunity to chat with you. Welcome, Eva. And uh, now I guess I'll turn it over to the, the world out there. All of you watching, uh, if you have questions, uh, comments about uh, the video that you saw yesterday, or whenever you saw it, you could see it today, you could see it tomorrow, but hopefully you've already seen it. Uh, please post them to the question and answer um, uh, function, or yeah, well, please post them to the question and answer function. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and um, good afternoon or good evening uh, from, from Poland. Hello. Yeah, you look a little, yours definitely looks a little evening-like there. You're much... Evening-like, that would be the, yeah. <laughs> it's gloomy. Well, maybe I'll get things started uh, by asking you just a, a relatively specific question about a, a phase of your presentation. Um, and that is, you showed the one house, right? The, the house in which all these people were born. And you told us about the name of the street, or the how the street name. This is a classic thing about East Central Europe, right? How the names change in different places. I wasn't sure if the average watcher, viewer of that video would be able to totally understand the point you were making by talking about all the different names of the streets. So could you just spend a few more minutes 
describing what those different names meant. And, and um, yeah, I, I remember I, I've been working with a doctoral student here in the history and classics department who's from Subcarpathian Ruthenia or from the part of Ukraine that used to be part of Czechoslovakia, which used to be part of Hungary. And there's a joke about that area where, you know, a woman is asked, uh, where did you live? And he, she said, I lived in all these different countries. Uh, and she never moved, right? Because she lived in all these different, she lived in six different countries in the 20th century, but never had to move from her house. I think your point is a similar one, right? That, that the people born and living in the house that you showed us in Silesia uh, didn't have to move to experience different contexts. So could you- Exactly, of course, uh, thank you. V very much so, very much so indeed. Uh, so all my uncles and, and my aunt, um, they, they, they were born in a different, different time, depending on the political system uh, and the political regime even. Um, the, the, the names of the street um, have, have varied. Um, and of course, someone who was a hero for for instance, uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet Russia, or the um, was not a hero a decade later. Uh, so then the names have been uh, changed depending on the uh, authority of the city and authority of the of, of Poland um, and and the uh, sort of Soviet Union as well. There were also, of course, the the Bismarckstrasse. Clearly, this is a nod towards um, the the German um, powers uh, that at some point were governing, uh, especially Silesian, uh, Silesian region. Uh, it was very um, interesting, I imagine, and from what I've heard from my family, to live and in those times and those political systems that sort of overlapped, because you had to hide all the things that you have bought, all the books that you've had, uh, that you bought in the 40s, because they were frowned upon 10 years later. And you had to um, throw every souvenir that had the German Gothic uh, on it, for example, because at, even five years after you have purchased it, it was no longer valid and you could have gone to jail or you could have been fined or you could have been um, you know, socially excluded because it was not something to be proud of. Uh, so each decade or each uh, name, the name of the street um, had carried a different political load and also a different uh, load of political correctness and also language. Uh, so so um, that's what I was talking about in the, in the presentation, that my aunt was born at the you know, uh, Bismarckstrasse street and everybody uh, was forced to speak German back then. Um, so she can speak fluent German and fluent, uh, fluent Polish. Uh, but 20 years before her, or 15 years before her, when my when my uh, uncle was born, because uh, there were you know, there's a huge gap between them, um, German language would be would be banned at home. You could not speak it. It was only Polish. So so that's why they they have uh, four different addresses, even though they've never moved. It's first <laughs> what you have said. You could have traveled easily back then, I guess. Okay, we have a question from Mark Landry. Uh, can you see it there? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm reading it. Uh, thanks. Maybe I'll read it for everybody. Just uh, Thank you. if I understood you correctly, the artist you presented is motivated by notions of Heimat. I know very little about the Polish language or Silesian dialect, and I'm curious about this term. Is it Silesian dialect or is it more used, broadly used in Polish? I asked because the yeah. German which term Heimat has been the focus of a lot of scholarship. In German, Heimat is very connected to regional landscapes. Is this true of Heimat in Polish as well? Mm -hmm. but thank you very much uh, for this question. Actually, the word Heimat, it comes from the German language. Uh, so, so the origin is, is, is there in the German language. So it was uh, sort of borrowed, if you will. Uh, but the spelling is, is Polish. So, um, it's, it's not capitalized as other nouns in, in, in German language because we, in Polish language, we don't capitalize the nouns. Uh, however, it, the sound of it and, and the, uh, the origins is, is German, but um, this is specifically a Silesian term. Uh, I cannot go to Warsaw and say, I'm so sad because I left my Heimat because they will not know what I, uh, what I mean by that. Um, even if I, if I, uh, I am in, in Krakow now, in Krakow, even if I use this word here, I don't think that 
people would understand me. So it's a very, my husband is, is, is just uh, saying that they wouldn't understand me here. So, um, so yes, they, they would not um, get, uh, get me at all. So it's specifically uh, Silesian and it's very, um, should I say it, intimate. It's really, it emphasizes maybe not necessarily the, the landscape, but it focuses more on the emotional uh, relationship with, with, your, uh, with your homeland, with your uh, district, with your street, with, the, with your neighborhood, basically. So, so the emotional focus is there, not as much as the landscape. The Silesian landscape is acquired taste, I would say. Um, yeah, but the language, um, the, the word itself uh, carries an emotional load more than sort of a landscape one, very much so. Okay, so, Mark, I hope that answers the question about Heimat. Obviously, when somebody hears it who knows German understands that it has some connection there. And I think you mentioned in your discussion or in your in the video that the Silesian dialect does have a, a, a number of German terms in it, right? That there is a connection. Very much so, yes. And and my sister, um, my, my sister, my parents would speak Polish at home. Um, and they would use German if they didn't want us to understand uh, something. Uh, and when uh, my uh, went outside to play with her with her friends, uh, they would speak Silesian. And my sister uh, most often did not understand Silesian uh, because they didn't want my parents didn't want her to uh, to learn this because at school it would have been again frowned upon. Uh, so when she went outside and played, uh, the the kids would use Silesian words, and she would not be able to play with them because she simply could understand what they were saying to her. Uh, and that's why I decided. And for a long time, I was not into that. I was maybe not ashamed, but I thought it's. It's not something appropriate to, to speak Silesian, uh, but then I had a change of heart and, and I uh, came back to my roots, so to speak. And I, you know, I'm trying to make up for the lost time when I wasn't so uh, interested in Silesian language and my sort of heritage. So, so here I am, uh, you know, trying to make up for the, for the lack of interest when I was younger. But you are living in Krakow now, or you're, you're coming to us from Krakow. So you have left home a little bit, the high mind. Just, just three days a week. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot leave my heimat for for a longer period of time. Most definitely not. Um, but that is true that I can use this word only, and it's really ironic that I can only use heimat to the people that I that share the same feeling. I cannot go and um, discuss it, the nostalgia, with other people because they don't have a. Homeland would be the closest equivalent I can think of, but homeland would be such a broad term, and and Heimat is just a, this street, you know, the, you live in, and something like that. Oh, that street, even that close, because that's a question I had: is what are the physical limitations of the concept of Silesia? When we talk about Silesia, actually, historically, right? There's two different sections: there's Upper and Lower Silesia, that's and. True. Uh, you think of Silesia and the Silesian dialect, is that more specific to Upper Silesia? What's the role of, of Wrocław? What's the role of Lower Silesia um, in the concept of Silesian identity? Uh, I am not an expert on the subject, unfortunately, on, the, on Lower Silesia, but uh, I know that they've been uh, also under very strong influence of, of, of German and German language, uh, Germany and German language, and um, I would say that they are even more organized as the stereotype is at least that the, the lower Silesia um, have this German uh, sort of gene about them, uh, that they like things to be organized. And, and so that's the stereotype. If I were to, to name a stereotype, that would, be, uh, that would be this one, that they have the, the echo of the German Ordnung uh, reverberates there. Uh, but I am not sure that they actually do have a dialect. I'm not sure that they have this, um, their own language. I think they speak a more uh, proper Polish than any other sort of, of, of a dialect. Um, so when I think of Silesia um, and, and its equivalent or something to compare it with, I often think of, of Catalonia. Uh, they also have this internal need or, or, or um, to, to announce, maybe not announce, but to stress that they have something, something else also, apart from being Spanish, if, if I may say so, because I think they're partly Spanish as well, and I am, of course, Polish. 
um, there is this need to show that there is something special or unique about them. And of course, they have their own language, uh, which is, you can, I guess, they can understand Spanish, but I don't think that every Spanish person can understand a, a person from Catalonia perfectly. Um, so I think that there are certain similarities, more similarities between Catalonia and Silesia than uh, Upper Silesia than between uh, Lower Silesia and Upper Silesia, I would say, in the terms of, you know, uh, trying to be independent in a little way. In a, in, a, in a way, more independent, perhaps. It's an interesting parallel with, yeah, and you've, you've studied in Spain and written about Spanish issues as well. Interesting parallel to think of uh, Catalonian um, uh, separatism or identity construction vis-a-vis -vis Upper Silesian. Uh, our Hungarian uh, researcher on staff, Jerzy Rajna, was not able to join us this morning, but he sent in a question after watching uh, your presentation, that, which I think might uh, be related. His question is, uh, is this Silesian identity that is reflected in the artwork that you showed relatively new, uh, or does it build on pre-existing traditions? Um, he was thinking in terms of how this is a contemporary artist, somebody who's working now. Does that uh, mean that this is a new development, the Silesian identity is just recent, or does it have deeper roots? Um, there is a lot of uh, artistic uh, tradition in Silesia, in painting especially, uh, but the, the other artists and works uh, that treat on, on Silesia and Silesian landscape is, um, are the representatives of art naive. Super bright, uh, extremely saturated colors, um, the shapes are even childlike, if, if you will. Uh, so there is a different school of perceiving Silesia. I don't know if this was uh, some sort of um, making up for the lack of color in the real world. Uh, perhaps Art Naive would be uh, a nice uh, sort of, you know, a counterpoint. Uh, but Art Naive would be the thus far present uh, tradition in painting in Silesia. And Valtrek is in my opinion, at least, he's trying to elevate this. So it's um, so it's not only this the city Silesia with either coal or or art naive uh, paintings hanging on walls, because um, that's also the stereotype. The stereotype of a Silesian person outside Silesia is, um, I, I would say, a, a simpleton or someone who uh, is indecisive and cannot really manage well. But then again, there is this strong uh, work ethic that's so present that the people going to, to work underground in the mines. Um, and, and there is what is interesting about this, uh, sorry, sort of um, off topic, <laughs> uh, but still in Silesia, there is this very strong notion of a woman uh, dominating in the household. So, so it's not the man who's the head of the household, it's the woman. So every, um, every two weeks, the wage would go directly uh, to the to the wife, not to the husband. Uh, so that was something that's unique, um, I think, about um, the stereotypical family or Polish family, at least. Uh, so, so I think that uh, especially the painting, and nowadays more and more uh, plays, theatrical plays, uh, show and demonstrate the history of Silesia, that the brutality of the police when there were protests in Silesia. Um, a few decades ago. So, so I guess Silesia is getting more and more good press and it's getting trendy. There are a few companies that produce um, outfits with Silesian words on them. It, it's getting hip, I would say, finally. Well, it just, Captain Fitz, I just hosted the big uh, worldwide Congress on climate change. What was it, last year or so? I mean, the, indeed, indeed. the name and the city are worldwide, are, are known across the world now, I would say. Have you noted, so you've noted the difference? I mean, I've been going there for about well, five years since we've set up this relationship with the university, and I know a lot of urban redevelopment, this whole attempt to reinvigorate the tourist industry, build on the art deco and architectural history, to work on the kind of post-industrial history uh, or post-industrial world, and to try to integrate the industrial landscape into the present is, is ongoing, it looks like. I, I, I would have to uh, agree. Uh, yes, it is, it, is getting, uh, it is getting out there. It's being promoted. Its architecture uh, has been changing. 
uh, we have this beautiful uh, auditorium hall, the second best in the world. Uh, that's what they say at least. Uh, it's it's really um, it's really good, and it's a proud moment, uh, a proud moment to to see those changes. Uh, you know, I, I I know the landscape. I know it's you know aesthetically challenging uh, or uh, you know, it's not beautiful in this sort of, uh, it's not Venice or anything like that. Um, but it's getting, it's, it's good press uh, and it's changing. And um, it's also getting promoted by arts and in arts. That's the best way, I guess. Uh, you cannot force someone to, you know, you have to like say Lisa now. Let me show you what it is. Let me show you the work that's, that's being done, done, done there, right? Let me show you how good it can be. So I think this is a better approach. I should say, I, I see that there's a, another couple questions in, in the question air box, but um, maybe, Rochelle, could you post to the uh, chat the link to Ava's presentation? Because someone wrote and said that they hadn't seen it yet. So we should make sure that people know how to see it. I wouldn't recommend seeing it now when we have the presenter live, but we should definitely make sure that we have a link. You, you posted the link to the all, various Austrian centers events. You should post uh, something uh, to um, the presentation we're discussing right now. And maybe while we're at it, we can post something about just the ongoing online events that the Worth Institute is sponsoring. I can talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second. Uh, because I know um, I saw another question in the question and answer, but because you raised the issue of uh, Silesian art and the artistic traditions, it leads me to Professor Osadnik's question. Uh, I think there's a good uh, link here. Again, he apologizes for not being able to be with us this morning, but uh, let me read you his email. Uh, and I, I hope, um, uh, yeah, well, I'll, let me read you his email and, and see what you have to say in, in response. Sure. First of all, he also says that the lecture was very interesting. So, you know, he gives you a thumbs up on the interest. In the <laughs> I'll have to thank him later. Thank you. <laughs> Many artists from Silesia are famous for their unique approaches to themes and techniques of contemporary art. We talked about that. Let me mention the ST53 group, which member with members such as Konrad Svenarski, Claudio Zdrushik, Vlad Valdemar Zvetsi or Maria Obrema, Obremba, the first mm -hmm. of Avir Rojek. So you don't get confused about which wife of Slavomir Rojek uh, we're talking about. To name just a few. The group was interested in post-cubism, minimalism, and Stravinsky's approach to art. Do you see any influence of ST53 on Valzak's art? This is a pretty mm -hmm. good question. Did you get it? Should I Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was thinking of that and it's a very interesting question. Professor Osanik thought of that because actually I chose the works uh, that are not, um, you know, Streminski's work is, is very uh, minimal uh, and, and he synthesizes the forms in his painting um, and, and, and the rest is more sort of exactly more uh, cubist. Uh, they're not very um, uh, mimetic in, in their works um, and actually the, this is the pictures that I've, cho I've chosen they come from the latest cycle of, uh, of Valchak's works uh, but the, the former ones they are actually very similar um, to, to what Professor Osadnik has, uh, has mentioned so uh, very much so there must be some sort of a, um, inspiration or perhaps certain uh, zeitgeist that reverberates through the canvases uh, because his uh, previous works um, are very, are less figurative. Uh, it's more form. It's more, um, as I have said, uh, at first he was called an expressionist or a new expressionist. Uh, but he also has, um, and then he sort of calmed down and developed this more figurative painting, this more figurative style of painting. But his previous cycles do allude uh, or do refer to, um, to those old, or different, uh, older or different schools of painting. Uh, so, so I could say yes, um, yes to his question. Uh, yes, there are certain similarities, there are certain uh, parallels between, maybe not these works that I've showed you, uh, but his previous works more certainly. So, so there is this, I don't know if, if Professor Osanik has 
really um, spot on intuition when it comes to painting. He just took one uh, look at them and, and he thought, oh, this might be it. But it could have been, it could have been so. Yes, absolutely. Well, this is an interesting issue that maybe we could develop more when you come here to uh, Canada, uh, because your appointment was going to be in the Department of Art and Design. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be uh, students and colleagues in the Department of Art and Design who would be interested in discussing this further, right? And in fact, one of our participants from the University of Alberta who went to Silesia was an art design professor. Uh, professor Gajewski was there um, a couple of years ago. I don't know if you had an opportunity to meet him. No, 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 no. He, I didn't. Um, he would be a logical contact uh, in the art and design department when you get here. So uh, just something to think about when you arrive. And you know, I've been told that uh, Katowice's art museum is now considered one of the better ones, best ones in Poland. Um, and if, for those of you who haven't been there, and I'm guessing most of you haven't been there, <laughs> it's in an old mine. So you see the, the kind of utilization of uh, industrial spaces and the, the role of the mine, which you saw actually in the picture um, that Ava, one of the a picture of the paintings that Ava posted, is obviously deeply rooted, if you pardon the expression, in uh, the Silesian identity, right? That they put their art in the mine and you have to kind of go down and actually participate, yeah. yeah. You have to go underground to, to appreciate it, to, to see the art. So, so that's, very, that's very tricky uh, and also very interesting. And there is a, a, one of the galleries is uh, made to make it look like it's a, it's a mine. So you can see the, the chains, uh, the, the clothing, the, the uh, changing room of the miners. Um, it's, it's a very interesting experience. Even, you know, Tuesday is free admission. So I usually go there on Tuesday. Uh, and I used to go there quite often and every time it was just such a, I don't want to sound too cheesy, but it is a magical experience when you, every time you go underground and, and you appreciate and you see something from a different perspective, it's just such a joyous moment, I would say, even if it's underground. <laughs> well, as a descendant of miners, it's another kind of interesting turn of phrase, a descendant of miners. Um, it was interesting to me too. Ooh, that's a nice expression. I like that. <laughs> to go through into that antechamber, yeah. right? Where you have to change or imagine changing clothes because not only do you move subterraneously or move into the subterranean world, you have to change into a different outfit, right? And that was part of that, that kind of antechamber they have in the museum there to kind mm -hmm. of thinking in a different way, right? You're the mind, the world of the people who work below the surface as opposed to the people who work above. But let me get back to the questions that are coming in. There's another one here that I wanted to ask you or make sure you get asked. How mm -hmm. much religion influence Silesian identity? How much does religion um, and, uh, influence Silesian identity? I would say religion is a part of Silesian identity, but it's um, it's a very naive, um, maybe a perception of, of religion and being religious, because I guess it is a custom that people would go to church every Sunday and you had to have your best dress for Sunday. But at the same time, um, Silesia is full of uh, magic powers or mysticism, especially for the mining um, industry, for lack of a better word, for, for the mining um, society, if you will. Uh, for the miners, because there is this uh, treasure genie, Skarbek, who is the genie that, um, that uh, protects the miners. Uh, and every mine would have its uh, figure or its paint uh, portrait somewhere inside, even downstairs, underground. Um, and, and there's plenty of other genies and witches and fairies that, um, that intervene in your everyday life. And if you couldn't find something, you would say, oh, this and this fairy or genie took it. Uh, so, so there is religion, but it's a very naive um, religion, I would say. Um, and it's something, it's like being a child and believing in Santa Claus. Um, and something like this. There, there is a lot of genies, witches. So religion, yes, of course, no, because you couldn't have... Um, you couldn't afford to be to be sort of um, to to annoy the priest, the local priest. You couldn't do it because the priest is the figure of authority, of course. Um, but at the same time, um, it was 
lessened, that the religious load was lessened by the, by the sort of magical forces present. And even now, if you go to Katowice uh, Market Square, there is a, uh, a, a bronze um, figure, the bronze sculpture uh, of Skarbe, which is the treasure genie of, of miners. So even people who, who are not directly uh, connected to mines would not believe, but would have this presence and presences in their everyday life. So religion is a part of its identity, religion identity, but I wouldn't say it's defining uh, element. It's, it's somewhere there, um, but there are more exciting things to believe in, I guess. <laughs> more because I think one of the questions might be just the role of the standard old line Christian denominations, a Roman Catholicism, or I don't know, Lutheranism. Uh, these are not playing as much of a role as... as uh, of course. In Poland, uh, being a Catholic is a is something too. Um, that that's the stereotype, of course, right? Uh, and and Silesia is uh, is Catholic, and and um, I think that would be the the dominant uh, religion in in Silesia, as as it's you know the case for for whole of Poland. Um, but it wouldn't be um, if you didn't go to church or if you went to church a little drunk it's still, you wouldn't be excluded from the community. It wouldn't be this one thing that if you don't go to church, the community will turn their back on you. It's not the case. It wasn't that uh, sort of black and white. Um, so, so, so it's not as radical as some might uh, suspect. The, the, I think the, the magic element would be uh, more, more important in a way. Of course, everyone would have across at home um but you know you, you you should pray to all the gods and you should get all the help you you can get so that's why i think miners would uh, would also would have a, a picture of a painting of jesus or or you know holy mary and at the same time just to be on the safe side uh they would leave a, a, a you know a slice of bread for the genies uh, that would be the uh, I don't know, maybe St. Barbara is often the patron saint of miners. I know many mining communities. Yeah, St. Barbara. Barbara is around, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's funny because Vachak lives on St. Barbara Street, actually. Yeah, okay. Well, there's a traditional connection between uh, veneration of St. Barbara and mining and mining, uh, mining traditions. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Katowice also has a history of strong Jewish presence. Uh, I know the Zionist movement connection historically to uh, Katowice as well. So there's a variety of different uh, religions, I guess, associated. But you're, you're stressing the magical element and the, the genie, uh, the, the genie that plays a role. This might be a good uh, link to a question that was presented by our Polish researcher, Joanna Dobkowska Kubacka. Uh, she's interested in the term uh, Gorol, Gorol that uh, you used, uh, that you said, I think that uh, even you have at times said that about people, right? Uh, um, that this, this concept though, she says in Polish comes obviously from Gora, from mountain, and it mountain people. And she uh, asks, why are highlanders, mountain people, synonymous with strangers for Silesians and not people, for example, from Krakow, right? They are the so yeah, if you could just talk about that term a little bit more, why are the Highlanders mountain people? Uh, why is that term used to refer to non Silesians? Mm -hmm. uh, I think Gorol is, um, uh, of course, it, it, it's a word that means um, not in the same term, the other. That, that's not it, that's, a, that's not entirely it, at least, right? It's not something that we say. Um, to, to sort of um, distance ourselves. It's uh, from, from someone who's not from Silesia. But we have this, um, this saying that if, you do, if you're doing something in a silly matter or, or in a silly way, or uh, you don't understand Silesian language, we would use this term, uh, you know, just to, to mock somebody. Uh, I guess it's, uh, it comes from the, uh, the, the Highlanders uh, because it was a different region. It was the, the closest, it's a neighboring uh, region, but you know, it's not us in a way. Us, I mean, of course, in inverted commas, right? I guess anyone who doesn't or who wouldn't understand Silesian language uh, would refer to as Gorol, 
And funnily enough, it's not aimed at people from, uh, from mountains or highlanders, um, but from neighboring uh, Sosnowiec. That would be the people <laughs> of Gorols. Uh, that would be the that would be the place. And unfortunately, I, I feel terrible if someone is from Sosnowiec or you have friends there. Please just <laughs> don't let them know. Uh, but there is a saying. Is it the that, Institute for English Studies there? Don't you work there? Uh, I do work there, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> we have the saying in Katowice that uh, the, the the apartments uh, above the tenth floor are cheaper because the view is. You can see Sosnowiec's balcony. It's terrible, it's unfair, it's absolutely, it has no grounds in reality. It should not be happening, but for some reason it is. I guess every country or every region has this one place that, that it's sort of, you know, like this little cousin that we don't like. Uh, yeah. But with love, of course, it's not an ongoing war, uh, but as I have said, if I'm, you know, if we are in the car and there is a silly driver, to, so it it helps to navigate, I guess, in the complex reality that that I I would you know refer to it. Well, I, I come from Southern Ohio in the United States, and I can tell you some jokes about Northern Kentucky and people from Kentucky. There you go. There you go. The it's other a, side of the river. They're over on the other side yes, of the river. And there is a river. There is a river, of course. And Professor Biawas, uh, of course, lives there. So we have this banter, an ongoing banter, and there is a river between us, of course, and it's a, it's a whole story. But funnily enough, it's not aimed uh, at people from, uh, from the mountains. It's for some reason aimed at people uh, from Sosnowiec. Well, that used to be also Russian Poland, right? So there's also Indeed. this historic That's boundary within Silesia. You have these, these divisions so that you cross that river. I mean, that was actually back in the old days, the Austro-Hungarian days, uh, a tourist site, I think, because three empires came together there, right? It would be exactly. The That's the triangle of the three emperors. That's exactly it. And and uh, Silesia, I mean, Katowice and Siemianowice and, and so on and so forth. We were the German uh, sort of partition or the German side, and Sosnowiec was the the, the Russian one. Uh, so so the the border or the uh, division stems from from this period. Uh, the we Krakow were... would then be the Austro-Hungarian side. Of the exactly, Austro exactly. So, so these local, these are local after all. Division, divisions come from uh, from this period of time when the, there was the Austro-Hungarian uh, part, Russian part, and German part. And and we were we were right in Katowice. This was the sort of more industrial part with with railways and and you know brick buildings and toilets and it was big achievement. Whereas Sosnowiec was not necessarily as uh, advanced because of the, of course, uh, Russia. It was not because of the people of Sosnowiec. Right. Uh, but somehow it, it remained there, this, this sort of mental border, if you will. Well, this is striking to me how these mental borders still exist this many generations later with all these different changes, but people still remember some of them. We had a conference few years ago at the Worth Institute called Crossing Central Europe, and it was partly about the memories that still exist of, say, for example, the Austro-Hungarian Empire's connections across space, even though it was been a hundred years since those, those particular borders existed, there's still mm -hmm. the imagination of people, uh, and they may not even know why they're making fun of Cisnoviets or, or people from there. That's true, that's true. And uh, it, it's funny, too, there is absolutely no sensible reason for me not to like people from Sosnowiec. <laughs> I, I work there, I'm perfectly okay, but every day I would go there when I was a student, student my parent would ask me if I have a passport because I'm crossing border. Uh, it's just, you know, an ongoing... Every day they still ask that, uh, uh, that question. Yeah. Some jokes, they don't get better, but they last. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> True. I think that's the case, unfortunately. That's yeah. the case. I'm sure, you know, um, Krakow has jokes about um, another little town that's around, and it's just an endless circle of, 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 of mocking one another. But that's good, I think. It's better to mock one another than to be, you know, that serious about um, offending and hurting each other's feelings. Well, we have a, a, another question here uh, from Zainia Kopf. She's the Austrian researcher at the Institute. Uh, she, her question focuses on the concept of identity. 
uh, and I'll read it to you. Uh, identity, as I understand it, is something relational and fluid being created and recreated by contemporary cultural practices. I wonder how that the concept of identity you are using with regards to the specifics of Silesian identity. Specifically, I'm interested in how contemporary Silesian identity could be described beyond language. E.g., what would be elements of Silesian identity in Valsak's paintings that go beyond language? What do you think? What goes beyond language? Um, beyond language, in, in those paintings that I, I've uh, shown you, first of all, on the technical level, I think would be the, the gray color, unfortunately. Uh, there are some, uh, the, the four gray figures, um, the grayness of the, of the uh, cross-section of the mind, uh, the saturation of gray in this painting where there is this, um, the, the house, my house is my castle. Uh, so I think that the gray, because um, when you ask someone from outside, from another region of Poland, what would be the go-to color when painting Silesia, I guess it would be black and gray. And, and rightly so, of course. I'm not, you know, offended by that and no one should be. This That's just what it is. It's not, you know, we're not famous for gardens. Um, what about the red and, paint on the workers' houses uh, on the windowsills or something? A little bit. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, yeah. That uh, every miner would get once a year um, a can of paint, and they would have to paint the whole neighborhood of miners would have to paint uh, their windowsills one color. So it's sort of more um, united and unified. Uh, and of course, the the very subject matter, which is the mines and and the the mining accident that uh, happened a few years back. Um, these are very current topics uh, for Silesia, uh, for Silesian people. Um, so I guess the identity would be based or, or uh, created on the, the mining history, uh, the mining industry that's sort of dying off nowadays, um, which is of course a bittersweet feeling, right? Because you feel like you're maybe not losing, but you're part of your identity. But, but you know it's good for, 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 the, for the betterment of others uh, and, and the planet. This is something we can sympathize with or empathize with here in Alberta, I think, with uh, the well. changing, uh, changing environment of uh, energy resources and things. Yeah. Indeed, and if this was something that you build your entire identity upon, you, you feel, you know, heartbroken, I would, I would imagine, that this is something, they're ripping you apart in a way, saying you are no longer needed. But this is just another, you know, it's another um, conversation. But but to answer um, this question, I guess the, the technical level would be that the colors, the palette and the hues. And on the thematic level, that would be the, the mining industry, uh, the miners, and of course the house, because the house that he painted in my, in my house is my castle. That's a typical uh, Silesian, uh, it's called familog, so it's an old tenement when uh, mining families would, would live for generations, of course, as, as is the case of Valchak, as is the case of my, my family. Uh, so, so I guess that would be the answer to this question, that the miners and the house and the colors would all come together. Well, uh, just as an aside, people here root for a professional hockey team called the Oilers, uh, which is a reflection of a particular phase of, of uh, economic development in the area, right? Uh, oil extraction industry, and there's a lot of nostalgia for for the days of oil. And uh, we we have a rugby team. Uh, we have a rugby team, Silesia Miners, yeah. and outfits are green. <laughs> they should be gray, right? <laughs> they should. They should be gray, exactly. Maybe after a game, they are black. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that brings me to a question I had. Um, based on your presentation, and that is you use the term uh, milk cow to see the way that Silesia is understood by the rest of, I think, Poland, is that if I understood it correctly? How does that affect identity when the region is seen as a place that's just basically exploited by others? If I understand the way you're using that term milk cow, it's, it's not a, a totally a familiar term to me, but maybe cash cow would be a, a good English uh, use, uh, that this is a place where you, yeah, you're basically saying what, they're, the people there are exploited for their resources or you know, they're sent to the mines to dig up coal for other people's heating or something, right? Or what, can you talk a little bit more about the concept of Silesians as cash or milk cows? 
Of course. Um, again, this, this brings me back to, to Catalonia and because it is such a touristic center and, and um, it's just, uh, it, it perhaps um, it brings so much money to the national budget because of the visitors, maybe not this year, uh, but in the past, <laughs> in the past, okay, previous years, it was a, a, a tourism uh, that, that brought all this uh, revenue for, for national budget. Um, of course, Sardinia is not famous for its touristic sites, uh, but, but it is famous for, the, for, for mining. Um, and for instance, 60, 50 years ago, when Poland, the, the rest of the industry were not as developed, uh, you know, there was no IT uh, branch, there was no um, you know, Erasmus class, uh, anything. Um, so we just had to deal and we just had to work with what we had. And what Poland had was predominantly coal in the south. So we would be, uh, you know, the lion's share of, of money of the national budget would come from Silesia. And there was uh, this sad flooding of Poland in 1997. And the major, major subsidies uh, came from, uh, from the coal, from the money that the Silesia earned. And somehow there was this um, conviction in, in Silesian's mentality that we did not receive, um, you know, enough back, so to speak. Uh, and then uh, there was a few years back, there was this uh, changing of the name of the streets um, again, because we had a, a shift in in, uh, in the in the ruling party, uh, and they would rename uh, a square in Katowice, and they would rename it. Um, but the name of the president who has passed away uh, in, in this or, or died in this uh, flying uh, airplane catastrophe in uh, 2010, I believe. Uh, so, and there were protests uh, because they, it's not that we didn't want the name of, we didn't, but okay. Uh, we wouldn't hate the name if there were another street or another square, but they would take uh, a person who was important for the Silesian uprising and they would try to, you know, just get rid of this person who was very important for, and is still very important for the national or, sorry, Silesian identity. And they wanted to, uh, you know, to give us somebody else. Uh, so there is this, um, this feeling of injustice and, and there is a lot of name calling back and forth uh, between Silesia and the, and the uh, sort of capital authorities. Um, but, Yes, I think they're, um, not now, but a few decades back, the Silesia was one of the main financial providers and the coal would be, you know, uh, exported. Nowadays, I think we import coal from, from other countries, uh, but a few years back, it wasn't the case. This also sounds very familiar uh, with the politics of Canada, right? With Alberta feeling like for many years they paid into the national coffers of Canada than they received. And now when the economy is going bad out here in the West, uh, uh, the people back East don't appreciate all that's been done. I, I don't want to get into contemporary <laughs> Canadian so, politics. So you know, you know. I see a lot of parallels, right? Yeah, it sounds very familiar. And the rhetoric and how the politicians can use it is, uh, is familiar to me. It's something I've actually said to people here at the University of Alberta, one of the reasons we want to build up this connection with the University of Silesia is because of similarities, right? Uh, the mining and the, uh, the relationship with the middle and the kind of peripheral relationship, also mountains, the connections to, to mountains or to big track industries and things. Uh, I don't see anybody putting a question about this issue here, but I did see that the notice about this talk was sent around to the local German speaking community. Um, and this is because a number of the people in Alberta and in the western part of Canada came from Silesia uh, earlier. These are immigrants from Silesia, so German speaking immigrants from Silesia. And I I, I don't know too much about the history, but there's a hamlet here in Alberta called Nordegg, and it was founded by a Silesian uh, entrepreneur, a coal mining town founded in 1914 by a Silesian uh, entrepreneur named Martin Cohen, who changed his name to Nordegg, um, who came from Lower Silesia, from at that point Reichenbach. And um, uh, there is this kind of historical connection on some level because of the mining industry that people came here. Uh, 
we, one of the reasons the Worth Institute exists in Alberta is because there are so many people from Central Europe who came here over the decades, especially late 19th into the early 20th century, but continue to come here. Uh, we have a very large Polish community, but large numbers of people from uh, Silesia as well. And I, I'm sorry if there's anybody here at this discussion who is from Silesia or has grandparents from Silesia or, or whatever, uh, I would be very interested to hear your take on how Silesian identity is different from the perspective of a migrant or an immigrant from Silesia versus somebody who lives in Silesia, which is another issue we deal with at the Worth Institute a lot. The contrast between identity in the diaspora versus identity at home, right? What does it mean to be- There's another level, um, I can I imagine, that there is another level of, of difficulty perhaps, or more borders to cross to, to get to whatever it is that we're trying to get to, I guess. Well, I, I was struck that this series that the Austrian centers put together was called Austrian Identities. And uh, we already talked briefly about the concept of identity, but the, using the word Austrian in connection is also kind of complicated. Uh, I don't know how you felt about that. How do you feel about being in a series that's identified as Austrian Identities? Uh, did, that, did that strike you at all? I thought it was, to be perfectly honest, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, of all the names, of all the places, uh, it's an, it's an Austria, Austrian uh, identity piece, but at least it's plural. So it, it is open, you know, for, for more than one identity. So, so I, was, um, I was okay with it, yeah. And, you know, I think what we, this term here is used pretty broadly and the Worth Institute is Austrian and Central European studies, and we work with uh, lots of different cultures and identities. And Austria tends to be given kind of precedence, but that's more because of the formal funding mechanisms and who gives more money and, and, and the donation issue. It's not really about the content of the discussion, right? So I'm glad to hear that you didn't feel too offended by the, the title. And you, you are in old Austro-Hungary now, right? Uh, in <laughs> Even if it was only, well, how long was that part of Austria-Hungary? Only 60 years or, you know, it wasn't very long that it was there, but still, uh, there is some connection. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our uh, talk today. Um, I don't know if you have any concluding remarks you'd like to make. Uh, uh, I, I would like to say goodbye to everybody, but I'll give you the, the, the floor first or the, the Zoom camera first. Thank you for the Zoom camera, Professor. Um, I, I think if you, if any of you uh, uh, have any questions, just just please uh, feel free to to contact me via uh, Professor or or via your institute. Um, I was just it was a very enjoyable uh, evening and conversation. So I want to thank everybody and thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'll I'll echo that. Thank you very much for participating. I appreciate your the both the presentation and the discussion and remember everybody including you Ava this is the beginning right this is supposed oh, okay. to be, this is you know you're going to be coming to Alberta we'll have people there we have Professor Hasmat from uh, political science department is supposed to be going to in your direction in, yes 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 hopefully I uh, hopefully um, yeah my supervisors well, hopefully and if anybody out there uh, or who sees this later, because it'll be available for viewing later, would like more information about the University of Silesia, about the relationship, the exchange program that we have between the University of Alberta and the University of Silesia, please feel free to contact the, the Worth Institute. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't end by reminding you that the next of these Austrian identity <laughs> on Monday, November 2nd at 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. That'll be <laughs> That'll feature Gerald Steinacher of the University of Nebraska in the United States. Uh, this presentation is sponsored by the University of New Orleans Austrian Center, and it'll be focusing on another uh, set of identities, South Tyrolean identities. So we'll move from Silesia to South Tyrol. Uh, we hope to see you then. Um, goodbye, and see you at the next uh, Worth Institute event. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.